you have a lot of changes happening. And this is not only the above ground vegetation changes, but also the below ground soil composition. This is the soil development. And it's very important to stress that I'm not just talking about abiotic factors such as nutrient composition, but also the soil life. So this would be the bacteria, the fungi that are present in this soil. And this often shifts from more pathogenic soil life to more soil life that actually contains more symbionts, or actually positive soil. And this has been very extensively studied in a collection of fields around Vedua, which you can see over here. And these have actually been taken out of production over the course of 35 years. And what is very nice is that it actually means that if I go one day out to those fields, I can actually look ahead 35 years into soil development, which is a unique addition to this project. And these fields have actually been very extensively studied at the NEO. So for example, these are also three of the fields that I'm taking along in my research. So plants are sessile organisms. They cannot escape the soil that they're growing in, like for example animals. So they have to deal with whatever they're given. And you can imagine that this soil has a huge influence on how the plant performs. So again, the abiotic factors, but also the biotic soil life. But on the vice versa is that also these plants have an influence on their soil. So uh, for example, by the compounds that are excreted by the plant roots, or when the plant dies, the, the material comes available for the fungi in the soil. And this is the concept of plant soil feedback. And it's very important to understand that this feedback can be positive, can be negative, can be weak, <coughs> can be strong, and this all depends on the context. So what plant species are we looking at, what time of year. So it's a very variable uh, thing. And plant soil feedback also plays a very important role during this secondary succession or this uh, soil development. Because, like I said, over time, the soil composition changes. And this also means that the feedback between the plants and the soil change. So in the beginning, there tends to be more negative feedback. On the end, it has, there is more positive feedback. So what you actually get is that plant species will actually disappear from the vegetation because they're replaced by another plant species that has a better plant soil feedback. And this replacement of species is the whole concept of secondary succession. So what they've also looked at is, can we find correlations? Do we see that the plant species that are there during this early development compared to late development, do they have different root traits? So traits like how do the roots actually look? And they found patterns. So what they found is that, as you can see in the picture, that earlier plant species tend to have more simple root systems, while late plant species tend to have more uh, elaborate root systems. However, this is all based on Correlations is based on, okay, we tend to find this more in this place and that more in that place. So what I actually want to do is actually do a, uh, manipulate this and actually understand the causality of this. And I'm studying this in Arodopsis Thaliana. Um, it's an English called Tilcress. It's part of the Rassica family. Um, it's an annual plant and it occurs on these disturbed sandy soils. And it's actually considered a weed. So its ecology is actually not very well studied. So we do know that it's considered a plant species that occurs during this early development. However, when I visited these fields, I could actually find back this whole this plant species on every field, which was rather striking. Which means that we have a plant species, it's the same plant species, but it's in all these different fields, which means it has been exposed to a different type of soil, a different type of soil development. And here it comes into play that this is actually a molecular model plan. So uh, the whole genome is sequenced, for example, and a lot of these genetic pathways that I started my presentation with are actually established in the species. Also, there are a lot of molecular tools available, which allows me to look at an ecological phenomena, but actually try to understand it on a molecular genetic level. And something that I'm particularly interested in is root architecture. That's actually how does the root system look. And this is partly determined by the environment, but it's also partly determined by the genetics of a plant. So through these very intricate genetic pathways, it's actually determined at what position, for example, of a root, uh, a new of lateral root comes out. And, oh, I don't know what I did. Yeah, I'm back. So, what are traits that we would look at with root architecture? For example, main root plant. The 
number of lateral roots we see, the length of these lateral roots, and also the branching zone, so what part of the main root actually contains side roots. And you can imagine if you start making like differences in these traits, you would end up with completely different looking root systems. So one of the first and most obvious steps that we were making is take these plants from these different fields who have been exposed to a different type of soil and actually see, do we see variation in root architecture? And that actually seemed to be a case. So I don't know if you can all see the contrast of the pictures that well, but these are roots of uh, plants that come from different fields or at different stages of this soil development. And what we could see, although there are not a clear differences in main root lines, we could find big differences in the number of lateral roots, the length of these lateral roots, and also the branching zone of these lateral roots. So that's very interesting in that we, it's the same species, but it shows completely different root systems. And now we want to take the last step towards the molecular understanding. And we're doing this by taking an untargeted and a targeted approach. With the targeted approach, we want to use all this established molecular knowledge that we already have of this plant. We know exactly which genes are important for root architecture. And with now the new method of just because, I'm actually able to alter these genes in the plants or the populations that I've taken from these fields. And we can actually modify the root architecture and see how this influences plant performance. But we're also taking an untargeted approach by sequencing the complete genome of these plants and see if we can find little signs of microevolution happening in these plant genomes. So, to end up my uh, presentation, I hope that I've showed you how interesting it can be to look at a very fundamental question and actually to try to incorporate two very different research fields. And by the end of my PhD, I hope that we've gained some insights or determine the root architecture traits and gain insights into the genetic basis of root adaptation uh, to the soil. So with that, this, I would like to end my presentation and thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Vera. Very nice interdisciplinary work between hardcore plant development and uh, soil development, <coughs> as you mentioned. Yeah. Um, questions? Thank you for your uh, really interesting speech. Um, I was wondering, uh, especially about the last part of your talk, you indicated that you took three different fields, three different uh, you saw those plants. Did those um, samplings happen at the different times in the 35 years, like different periods, and is that a factor in it, or is it the difference in soil? Yeah, thank or you for your the question. Area. Yeah, so these are fields um, that all had an agriculture history, but they've been taken out of production in a different year. So, for example, field C, it was, uh, was taken out of production in 1992, while the B, it's the middle one, it's been taken out of production in 2005. And the first one, the root A, actually comes from a, from a field that's actually still currently agriculturally used. So, and these all have been sampled on the same day. And what I'm showing you is actually the, the, the second or the third generation plants. So I've taken the, the, the seeds from the plants that have been grown on the field. I took them to the lab and then I grown them and then I observed these differences in root architecture. So the idea is that although these are different fields, they have a similar sort of physical composition, so the type of soil is all sandy type of soil, um, and they all have a similar history, but the only difference is the time point when they've been taken out of production. So it yeah, would be the different stages of this development of the soil. Yeah. This very clear demonstration of the process within the roots and among the roots and the soil. Um, could you say something about the, the process 
question. I didn't mention this in the presentation. So um, the question was like, what are the actual differences? So um, as I mentioned, these are both abiotic and biotic. So what we see is that there is actually um, uh, an increase, an in initial increase of the fungal biomass. So that means that these previously agricultural soils don't have a lot of fungi. They in general don't have a lot of soil life. Um, so there's an initial increase of the fungal biomass, but what we also see is that the, the activity of the soil life actually increases. So um, there is more fungal uh, activity, bacteria. What we also see is that there are actually more interactions happening between these uh, this soil life. Um, something else that we see is that often these agricultural soils, because yeah, often they have been fertilized, they have a lot of uh, free nutrients. And what we see is that actually these nutrients get, get taken up into the, um, these um, soil networks. So they actually become less available to the, um, to the plants. And that's also something that we're thinking of that yeah, in later stages there are more symbiosis and you actually require a more elaborate root system. No questions? So, yeah, it's something that's for sure at the back of my mind, but not 